So um, is it too late to say good morning, or can I do that again? Well, at least it's good to see you, and I'm uh, happy that you're here. Um, it's going to be an awesome track in an awesome conference here, definitely. <coughs> so um, I'm going to kick it off with uh, start uh, this talk about aspect-oriented programming with uh, dependency injection. And uh, while the title doesn't say it, ob obviously the context here is .NET uh, development. So what I'm going to what I'm going to do here is talk about a little bit about what aspect-oriented programming is and how it relates to dependency injection. And um, what I want to do is do, uh, do this with uh, lots of code examples. So I'm going to write uh, code as we go along um, in between the slides. And if you think that my coding is a little bit slow at the beginning, this is just because I want to establish some context. So it's going to be faster as we go along. So if you're feeling yourself uh, dropping off at the beginning, it's, 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 uh, it's going to speed up as we go along. So that's the, um, that's the general thing that I want to talk about. So first of all, let's just have a little bit of a look of what is um, aspect-oriented programming actually. What, what kind of problem does it actually um, try to address? It tries to address a problem of what we call cross-cutting concerns. And um, if you haven't heard this terminology before, so, uh, you probably have seen it uh, at least um, if you have seen architecture diagrams like a layered uh, software uh, application diagram like this one, uh, you will probably have seen cross-cutting concerns illustrated as, as vertical bars sitting here next, next, to, um, next to the layers. So I didn't put any labels on this, uh, these layers here because it, it's not really relevant for, for today. So you can just imagine that this is some kind of layered software architecture. And um, normally you will see things like security and auditing and logging and so on represented by those vertical bars sitting um, besides because they don't really fit into this whole layering model. So what I want to talk about today is actually not the application, but all of those things. Those are the cross-cutting concerns. And the reason why we call them cross-cutting concerns is because they, they are concerns that cut across a lot of different features. So an application may have a shopping basket feature or um, a product catalog feature or a feature where you can upload images or whatever else it might be, but lots of different features in the same application. But cutting across all of those features are a couple of concerns like security, you want to be sure that the user is allowed to do what it is that he's trying to do. Uh, that you want to audit, you want to lock what is whatever is going on. Things like that should be applied across all of the different features that you have in your application, or a lot of them at least. They cut across features. That's why we call them cross-cutting concerns. So that's basically the same thing as an aspect. It, an aspect is just another word for a cross-cutting concern. Um, so that's why we, we talk about cross-cutting concerns when we talk about aspect-oriented programming. So, and I want to point out, by the way, that I started out just talking a little bit about layered software architecture, and, and I just want to point out that this is just to give you a, a starting point that should be familiar to most people. But cross-cutting concerns is definitely no, something that, that applies to a, a wider range of architectural styles than just um, a layered application. So examples of cross-cutting concerns, I was in, in um, Dan North's talk here the, the other day, and, and he asked, so are, are there any other examples of cross-cutting concerns than security and, and locking? And uh, there, actually, there are. Obviously, auditing, logging, and, and, and things like that tend to fall into the same category because we, we kind of record what, what happened as the application uh, is running. Um, but new things like metering, for example, if we have now, now that we're moving into a more cloud-based or software as a service-based um, application uh, infrastructure, it's, it becomes important to actually record how users are actually using our application. So metering um, might be an, a new example of a cross-cutting concern. Also, um, we have a lot more of a distributed software architecture and software environment today. Um, so we have a lot of reliance on external out-of-process resources. And if you read a book called Release It by Michael Nygaard, who's, who's here uh, today at the conference as well, um, he has in that book a section on stability patterns, uh, as they're called. Things like a circuit breaker, if you're aware of that one. So what it basically does is it, it tries to address the situation where um, an out-of-process resource becomes unavailable, and, and you don't want, it, want that to pull down your own application. So things like that is very uh, well implemented by viewing that as a cross-cutting concern as well. So there are defi definitely lots of examples of cross-cutting concerns that you want to address in your application. So that's what I want to talk about today. How do we actually implement cross-cutting concerns? And um, I want to have a little bit of a constraint about on how we want to 
address cross-cutting concerns, because obviously you can just write a lot of spaghetti code to address those cross-cutting concerns. But that's not what we want to do here. Everyone can do that. Now, I want to talk about how can we do that by following the principles of solid and dry. So anyone, uh, if you're aware of what solid is, can you please raise your hands? Okay, not, not that many. A few of you, but um, okay, so I'll just cover that. So solid is a set of five principles for object-oriented uh, software, and they were formulated originally by um, Robert C. Martin, also known as Uncle Bob. And, um, and they define how you write um, good object-oriented software. So th those are not the only principles, but it's, it's a pretty good um, set of, of principles to kind of measure your code against. So just um, in... Um, they, they, this is an acronym that actually stands for a lot of other acronyms. So this, this, the S is for a single responsibility principle, which says that every class should only have a single responsibility. The O stands for open-closed principle, which says that every class should be open for extension but closed for modification, which means once you've written the class once, you shouldn't have to change the code of that class all the time. If you want to add features, you can add new classes um, that extend the original class. The Liskov substitution principle says that uh, if a client talks to an interface, you should be able to exchange implementations of that interface without actually changing uh, or breaking the client itself. Um, that's very important for, for today here. The interface segregation principle says that um, you should design interfaces uh, so that they have very limited and, and, and very well-defined roles. Not that important in, in, this, um, in this discussion here. And the dependency inversion principle is pr basically the principle that guides dependency injection as a methodology. So, so those are a set of pretty good principles that guides whether we actually write good object-oriented software or not. It, it tends to be when we write solid code, we actually uh, write more maintainable code. And obviously, it sounds very good to be writing solid, solid code. So it's a very good acronym. Um, and that's probably why it, it it's, uh, has catched on. So, um, so that's, that's one of the, the objectives for today, is to implement cross-cutting concerns in a solid way. The other thing we want to do is we also want to um, address this uh, issue or this principle of dry, don't repeat yourself. So we want to do the first thing, and we also want to be able to do that without writing a lot of repetitious uh, code. And that turns out to be the, the most difficult thing, actually. So what I'm going to do here is just split up the talk and, and ju just first talk about how we do um, AOP with, um, by following the solid principles, and then afterwards we're going to add on how we also stay dry. Because the first time around, it's not going to be very dry. So, so that's the first thing I want to do. And that's, I'm probably going to spend about 20 minutes on this, and then we'll talk about dry for the rest of the, of the talk. So there's a prerequisite for this. So... Um, if any of you have heard about the idea about AOP before and kind of, or if you Googled it or looked a little bit about it, you've probably seen things like a, a tool called PostSharp that says it's an AOP framework for .NET. And it is. Um, but that's not what I'm going to talk about today here. We, here we're talking about loosely coupled code. So that's basically just, dependency injection is just a thing it, that you use to, to enable loosely coupled code. So basically the prerequisite for everything I'm going to talk about here today is you have to write loosely coupled code. What is loosely coupled code? Well, this is just this idea about programming to an interface, not an implementation. And, um, and I like this quote. It's actually a quote from the book Design Patterns from 1995. And the reason why I always uh, want to, uh, like to talk about this is um, this is not something new at all. It sits on page 18, just in the beginning of the book. So it was a well-known thing that is prerequisite for all the design patterns back in 1995. So um, it's just not something new or that, that someone just came up with. Lo loosely coupled code is a very fundamental thing to be aware of. So I have a conjecture here that says you can always apply a decorator to an interface. So a decorator is a design pattern from that design patterns book. And what it basically says is that um, when, we, when we apply a decorator, we add a new class that implements the same interface as, as another interface. And it wraps around that original implementation of the interface and just delegates to that original interface. But it could also um, add some new behavior along the way. So I have never seen this conjecture mathematically proven, uh, but I've also never seen it clay, uh, proven wrong. So I, am, I'm strong, I strongly believe that this is actually true for all interfaces. And this, uh, this is the um, fundamental 
thing that allows us to apply cross-cutting concerns in loosely coupled code. And let, let me show you how. And we'll, we'll look at some code in just a minute. So we have a client here. And uh, obviously, we have some kind of, of concrete foo class that, that is going to supply whatever behavior this client actually needs. But the client is not going to talk to concrete foo as a class. It's just going to talk to ifoo as an interface instead. So the client talks to an interface, and everything is good. So how can we add aspects or cross-cutting concerns to, to this ifoo interface? Well, that's pretty easy with a decorator, uh, because if we want to add auditing, for example, we simply add a new class called auditing foo, that's going to implement ifoo as well. And what it's going to do is just going to wrap around the, the, or, the original concrete foo that we had here and just delegate all of the operations to the inner class while adding some auditing behavior as lo along the way. And we can keep on stacking and wrapping those things. So if we want to add some kind of security or authorization logic to, um, to this stack here, we just create a new secure foo uh, implementation of ifoo that wraps around and delegates into to the, um, to the inner classes. So that's basically um, how we can apply uh, decorators, um, or we can use decorators to apply aspects. So it's, it's not very complicated, actually. So um, if this sounds abstract, let's, let's have a look at, at an example of this. Um, so I'm just going to switch over here. So I have a little uh, demo application here, and, and all the stuff in the bottom here is really not that very important at the moment. I'll get back to that later on. So what I have here is just a console application that currently does absolutely nothing. So if I run this, it's just this. Well, okay. And, and then it, we return again. So the reason why I have a console application and not something more complicated is just because I want to have a lot of... Um, of um, noise that would distract from the message here. So you can just imagine that this is whatever application framework that you currently use, whether it's a web application or a rich application and so on. Just, just imagine that the code runs inside your favorite framework. So what I want to do here, uh, let's imagine that this, um, that this application is some kind of store management system where we have a store manager that who can go in and, and, and add uh, edit his product catalog and add discounts for his products and so on. And what, what we want to do here is just program against interfaces when we do that. So I have a f an, an abstract factory here, or factory method, uh, that can create a discount repository. And if you look at the return type of, of this creation method here, it's an iDiscount repository. So that's just an interface that I defined myself. So I'm just kind of giving you a little bit of sense of what this application does. I'll, I'll be finished pretty soon. So what the store manager can do is just, it can just against that interface, you can program against this interface and say, well, I want to add a discount for the um, product ID 42 with this uh, particular price. And in a given time period, let's just say the, the period of um, the go-to conference, something like this. So this is just something that, you can uh, that he can do or the user can do. And, and we're programming against this IP discount repository interface. This kind of represents a feature that we have in the, in the program. Um, so imagine that we have some kind of other session going on later on. So I, I'm just putting this console write line in as a delimiter, which may, makes it a little bit more clear what's going on when we look at the output later on. So imagine we have another user sitting in another session, and he wants to do something else. So he doesn't want to use the discount repository. He wants to use the product repository, which is um, which is another interface here called iProduct repository. So two different interfaces I just made up for this occasion. And he's going to say, well, I want to discontinue this product um, because we're not selling that anymore. So that's basically it. So the way that I've implemented iDiscount repository and iProduct repository right now, just because this is demo code, I kind of cheated a little bit and just created an implementation of that that writes to the console. And, but you can imagine that this is where you actually write stuff into your persistent store, into your database. So it, it, it makes it a little bit easier to understand and, and follow along what's going on because I just write to the console. So, so the basic program session here, or the sessions actually look something like this. We just get a, a bit of output from both of those um, actions that we, that, we perform, that we perform. So that's it. So I want to add, add some uh, cross-cutting concerns to those two uh, features that I have product discounts and the product catalog. And the first thing I want to do is just add auditing. So since I already said that I want to have um, a, um, a decorator, I add an auditing discount repository. There we go. So the decorator of 
discount repository has to implement iDiscount repository itself, which only has a single method, so that's, that's actually not so difficult. So to decorate something, we have to have an inner uh, definition of that or an inner member that has the same um, type. So we will say we'll need something to actually delegate against. And um, I want to inject that into the class here. So I'll just say iDiscount repository, repository, and just um, save that one for later on. So this is standard constructor injection going on here. So th this is the dependency injection part of the talk. We actually don't talk that much about dependency injection. So what we want to do with this repository is just delegate the method call into the decorated repository. So I'll just pass those um, arguments along here without really changing them at all, period. Come. On. There we go. Yeah. So because this is auditing, I want to add some behavior because right now it doesn't do anything. Well, we have a new class, but it just doesn't add any value. What I want to do here is record that this actually happened into some kind of auditing system. So that's another dependency that I need. I need a dependency on my auditing system. So I'll declare that. Uh, just let's have a look. And if you see that I'm doing something very, very weird that's not going to compile, then please let me know because you know writing code and talking at the same time is actually not that easy. Um, I'll ask for the auditor system here as well. Auditory, no. There we go. Um, so, ah, that's, that's right, sorry. And I also think I typed so fast that I actually did something like this. So we'll, we'll call this auditor. Thank you. I think I, I thought I could hear some mumbling down there, so thank, thanks a lot. Is it right now? Uh, no squiggly lines. Okay, cool. So w what this auditor system needs is information about who actually performed this action. So I want to know about the user that actually invoked this method here. So I want to just the, the name of that user, that's, that's going to be enough uh, for now. So I want to go thread that. And we'll have system for threading here, current principle. No, current principle. Ah, damn you. Mm. Sometimes intelligence is actually a little bit, um, it has to know what I mean and not what I actually type. So what I want to do here now is just invoke the auditor um, dependency here and just say it has a record method where I can record what's actually happened. So I just say this identity name here did something. And what that identity did was to invoke the add discount method. So I'm just keeping this very, very simple because this is for demo purposes. But obviously, I could have audited a lot of other things here, like the time and date that this happened and the um, values of the, of the method arguments and so on. Let's see if this compiles. It does. That, that's good. So, the, um, so what I've been doing so far is just adding classes. So according to this open-close principle, I'm actually pretty, um, pretty good because I haven't changed any existing classes at all. I just added a new class that implements this auditing aspect. Um, and also the single responsibility principle is pretty, pretty um, intact because I have my console discount repository, which has the single responsibility of, of making output to the console. And then I have this auditor, which has a single responsibility of auditing. And those two things don't intermix at all. So. Pretty solid code so far. So the only code that I need to change is, is this thing called the composition route, the place where we actually compose all of those things. That's OK. Um, that's always a little price to pay. So I need an, an auditor uh, that actually implements that I auditor uh, thing here. And guess what? I have just a console auditor for that as well, just to, just to keep things simple. And I need the uh, auditing repository. There we go. Uh, auditing discount repository, passing in the other repository that I had before, and the auditing system that I just declared here, and I want to return this one. So there we go. So right now, if I run this application now, I should see a different output that I had uh, before, and we can tell I have um, this uh, yellow audit thing sitting up here, and, and it says uh, add discount. And actually, it doesn't say anything about the, the, uh, the user uh, who's uh, using this uh, at the moment. Be and this is because this run method here runs in a generic principle that doesn't have a name at the moment. So let's, uh, let's fix this. So I'm just setting thread current principle to a generic principle that actually has my name, just so that we can say, uh, see that now we have auditing that audits that Mark Seaman uh, invoked the add discount method. And this happens on a, on a different system. So that's why I, I created that in yellow instead of, of the white. Another thing, though, that we notice is that 
Uh, now we have auditing for um, product discount, that, he'll, th that the product discount feature, but we don't have auditing for the product catalog feature. So this is kind of why we're not dry at the mo in the moment. So to add auditing to the, to the product uh, feature, I'll need to do the same thing all over again. And I'll speed up now and, and do things a little bit faster here. So we'll do an auditing product cat repository, was it? Repository. And let's just go here and cheat a little bit. <laughs> because you don't want to uh, see me, me typing all of those st that stuff uh, once more. Um, but what's interesting to note here is if I just switch back and forth between those two implementations, maybe I should just... Um, Okay, so let's get rid of, let's start at the class so that you can actually see that we have the same, um, we start the same place. And if I just switch back and forth here, you can see those implementations are very, very similar. They kind of follow the same blueprint. They're not identical and that it's really difficult to actually reconcile those two things because they implement different interfaces and they have different methods. But basically what they do is they delegate to that method and then they get the identity name and then they call the auditor's uh, record method and just with a different uh, name of the method that they're actually auditing. So very, very similar things going on here. And this is why, I, and I'm pointing this out because this is why we're not dry at the moment. But we're definitely solid. So even to, to illustrate this further, we can just take the composition of uh, discount repository and I can just copy and paste that and just put it down here and I need to change one thing to actually make it work because I need to change that um, discount to product and then it's going to compile and now if I run the application I actually have auditing for both of those features. So that's, that's how we do, that's how we do, um, that's how we do aspect oriented programming or addressing cross cutting concerns with um, just the solid principles. And it's, it's worthwhile to notice that this doesn't require any kind of framework at all. So if, you, if, if you're thinking that dependency injection has um, a reliance on some kind of dependency injection container, uh, that's not true at all. This is just plain old C-sharp uh, code that, that I'm writing at the moment. Nothing special is going on. And I've written applications just doing this and just um, dry be damned. Um, and, and it has actually been working pretty, pretty well. I just uh, had a chance to talk to Dan North the other day in the training session here, and I, I said, well, there's this thing about dry and, and the way that we can't really stay dry without a DI container and so on. So he called that, well, yeah, but sometimes it's okay to be soggy. Uh, so that's uh, kind of the, the, op the opposite of being dry. Um, so that kind of makes sense to me. So definitely sometimes it's okay to be soggy uh, because it turns out that decorators that, like the ones that I just did um, actually, they tend to be very stable. Once you actually define them, um, they don't really change a lot. Um, so, so there's not a lot of maintenance uh, for, for those uh, things. Now one thing that I, I wanted to do, by the way, is I want to add another aspect to this, um, to this demonstration here, just in case, um, just to keep things a little bit more, um, just to keep things a little bit more difficult. So I want to add security as well. So I want to do secure, uh, let's just call them secure repositories. And uh, I'm going to cheat, so I'm gonna, just going to do this real quickly here, but just to, um, just to give you an idea that you can actually stack those things, because I, I'm going to come back to this later on. So what I'm going to do here with those secure repositories is I'm just going to do, if the current principle is in the role store manager, we're actually going to delegate into the thing that we're decorating. If not, we're not going to allow this thing to go through. And a real application code, you will probably return some kind of error message or throw an exception here, but just to keep things simple, I'm simply just not going to allow this thing to go through if you're not in the role of store manager. So we can just, um, we can just add those things, uh, and I need this for later on, so let me, let me quickly do this. So we'll do the secure repository here. I'm just adding the secure. I created both in once. Uh, in one file, and I, I never recommend that you have more than one classes in a single file, but I'm, I'm allowed to do this because this is demo code. <laughs> so just wrapping around this secure, the auditing repository here and then returning the secure repository instead of the auditing repository. And once again, I can more or less just copy and paste those two lines of code that I have here and just um, change the name from discount to product. So 
the, re the reason why I wanted to do this was, right now, if you think about the implementation of, of those security aspects here, I'm only allowed to, to do the call if I'm a store manager. And if I look at the current principle that I am at the moment, I don't have any roles at all. So we should expect the output to be absolutely nothing, which is the case. Well, we have this session delimiter here, but that's, that's about it. And just to prove that it actually works, I'm just going to add myself as a store manager here. There we go. So the reason why I wanted to have more than one um, aspect added here is just to show you how you can stack things. Also, um, my experience with, have, with just doing this and, and just being solid but not particularly dry is that you never really have to go in and re revisit those decorators once you implement them. So the, um, the main drawback of doing this is if you, add, if you have like five different aspects that decorate your core feature, this means that every time that you want to add a new feature to your application, not only do you have to implement that feature, but you also have to add five different decorators before you can actually declare that, that feature for done. And that's just a little bit of overhead that it would be nice to, to get away with. Um, it's, it's, it's pretty mechanical work that you have to do to apply a decorator like that. It's the same thing we do all over and, uh, over, and over again. So it would be nice if we could automate that. So for the rest of the talk here, I'm going to talk about how, how can we stay dry as well as solid. So basically what we want to do is take those, um, the decorators that we just did and apply that same principle, but just do it in a little bit more um, automated fashion. So what you have to be aware of when we do that is now we leave the, um, the area where, or the, the, the place where we can just do this by just writing plain old uh, C-sharp code. What we have to do is to rely on some kind of framework. Um, and we, we want to rely on something called dynamic interception, which is a service that some frameworks can give us. Those frameworks are typically bundled into DI containers, but they don't, they don't have to be. And I'll talk about what dynamic interception is in just a moment. So, but just to be clear, the rest of the stuff that I'm going to do here requires some kind of framework that can do those things for you. And those frameworks are often bundled by DI containers, like those four. And they are all open source, so it's not something that costs you any money, um, but it's just to be aware. Not all DI containers actually support uh, dynamic interception. Those are the only four that I'm aware of that actually do this. So Castle Windsor, Unity, Spring.net, and Linfu. Those support dynamic interception. There are other d d DI containers out there on the .NET platform uh, that can do a lot of other cool, th uh, cool things, but they don't have out-of-the-box dynamic interception. Some of them you can actually add dynamic interception to by using the extensibility points that those, those DI containers have. But you, what people typically do then is they pick one of the dynamic proxy libraries that, that, come, that, bundles, that bundles with some of those things here and, and reuse those. So Castle Windsor has something called castle.dynamicproxy, which is very widely used for this purpose. The, the castle dynamic proxy is also used for mocking frameworks like Rhino mocks and, and mock with a Q and so on. So, so that's a very, very nice standalone component that, that can actually do this for you. Right. So what I want to do here is um, show you how you would go ahead and do that with a use dynamic interception with a dependency injection container. And um, I could more or less just pick one of those four containers and showed you, and the code would have looked very similar. Uh, so I just had to pick one, and I picked Castle Windsor because that was the first one. So before I do this, I just want to change the application that I have at the moment into using Castle Windsor instead of using poor man's DI, which was what I was using at the moment, just to, to put it into a state where I can add dynamic interception to it. So basically what I want to do is those factory methods that I have here at the moment, I want to change the implementation of those so that they just call into the container. So we'll just call not release, we'll call resolve, and I'll just ask it to resolve the iDiscount repository interface. Totally the same thing happening here in the other factory method. Basically the same code. I'm just resolving iProducts repository instead of iDiscount repository. So what I have here, and I need to have return statements here, otherwise it's not going to compile. That looks better. 
So what I have here down here is I already um, I already prepared the um, the container down here in the um, in the constructor, um, but I only have mappings from I discount repository to console discount repository and so on. So none of the decorators that I just created are actually wired up by this uh, container at the moment. I'm just leaving it as as the core. Uh, functionality that I had before. So if we try to run this application now, we should see only the original output and none of the aspects here. So I could definitely have defined and configured the container to use those aspects as well, uh, the decorators that I just created, but that's not what I want to do here because I don't want to have those uh, soggy uh, decorators here. I want to get rid of those and just have my dry uh, aspects instead. So I'm going to leave them just for a little while, but I'm going to delete those decorators in just a moment. We'll, we'll leave them for now so that we can contrast them, and then we'll get rid of them. So this is just putting the, the application into a state where we have uh, a DI container wiring things up instead of poor man's uh, DI. So dynamic interception is, um, is, is a pretty nifty concept, and it's not that easy to understand, actually. Imagine that we have an, an XYZ behavior that represents some kind of cross-cutting concern. So that might be the, the template that we had before where we, to add auditing to, um, to a system, we kind of delegated to the original uh, or the inner implementation and then we recorded the, the action afterwards to this auditing system. So that might be some kind of blueprint or template for how that aspect might look like. And what we want to do here is basically just say for every interface that we want to decorate here, we want to have a class generated for us. So instead of writing that class mechanically by actually writing my co the code myself, I just want to have that framework define and generate that class for me. And um, I'm not a big fan of code generation, and that's not what dynamic interception does. What it does is it creates the class definition on the fly. So say we want to have, we want to decorate iFoo with this XYZ aspect, so what we ask the dynamic interception library to do is to create an XYZ uh, foo class that contains this blueprint that represents the aspect and implements iFoo. And the way we want to do that is just it's, just it's just using an algorithm to do that and define that class. And afterwards, it just using, uses reflection emit to uh, compile that class into the running app domain. So this is called reflection emit. And... Um, it's not, it's not new at all. It's been around since .NET 1.0. So this is a, a, something that you've been able to do for a lot of time. And actually, castle.dynamicproxy, which is the thing that I'm using here in this example, has been around for a long time. So it's definitely something that, um, that has been a, a possible uh, all since .NET uh, was uh, created. But the beauty of this is if I need to apply this aspect to, let's say, ibar instead, I just ask the dynamic proxy to emit an XYZ bar that contains this blueprint and implements I bar. And we can just keep on asking for stuff, saying, well, I need this uh, interface as well. Please auto-generate a class that decorates um, and implements this particular interface with that particular aspect. And this just happens just in time. So whenever the container needs to wire up those things and it knows those aspects should be included, it's just going to compile those classes and, and emit them into the runtime. And if you're thinking whether this is a performance uh, hit, it's not really uh, that much of, a, of an issue because this is something that happens once. So the first time it needs to create each of those classes, yes, it, it, there is a little bit of an overhead for that. But once you have the app domain up and running, these are emitted into to, uh, dynamically uh, generated assemblies. And you probably know that you can never unload an assembly from an app domain once it's, it's loaded. So those uh, class definitions just stay in the assembly until the assembly is recycled. And, and they just have different sources of, of, of where they are defined. Instead of be being defined by static source code, they're being defined by an algorithm that creates them on, on the fly. But once they, they're compiled, they behave just like any other class. Okay, so no, no special, once they're generated, no reflection overhead at all. So don't worry about those things. So let's, let's have a look and see in Castle Windsor how adding an interceptor would actually look like. So this is why, where we want to stay dry and add those same uh, aspects as before, just adding them as interceptors instead of adding new concrete decorating classes all the time. So the first thing I want to do here is add auditing. So I'll, I'll create an auditing interceptor. 
Let's make that public. It's going to work best that way. And I need to implement an interface called iInterceptor. So that's an interface defined by proxy. So if you would have been using uh, Unity or Spring.net or something else, the, the interface has a bit of a different name and looks a little bit different and it lives in a different namespace, obviously. But basically, it, it looks structurally the same. They are very, very similar across those different things. So what we have here is just a single method, which is called intercept. And this method will be invoked every time we need to invoke one of the decorated methods, like the, the discontinued product or the at, at discount uh, method that we had here. This intercept method is going to be invoked. And if we um, remember or try to recall back how we actually defined auditing here, the first thing we wanted to do in both those cases was to delegate to the method that we actually decorate. So we're just going to pass along the parameters. Now, in this case here, we don't know what it is that we decorate because we might be decorating a lot of different interfaces. So we can't just uh, declare that we have an, a, a, a dependency on, on the same interface that we implement itself. Um, but on the other case, this invocation argument here has a very um, inherent understanding of what method delegation is, is actually li li look like because this is the uh, overall purpose of an interceptor. It is to be able to delegate and add behavior. So um, this is simply done by doing this. Invocation proceed. What it means is the invocation should proceed to the next uh, decorated level uh, down in the stack. So we can get a lot of information out about, uh, about the current context from this invocation method here. The next thing we want to do here is um, get the, um, the identity name and, um, and audit that, uh, that this action was actually um, used. So I still need the auditor dependency here. So let's just copy that over here. I'm, I'm more or less just doing copy and paste code here because I want to move the template into an aspect and define that as an aspect. So let's use constructor injection to, um, to get that auditor into the system. So it's worth noting, noting that even though the, um, we implement a specif specific castle.dynamic proxy interface here, we can still use normal constructor injection just like before. So that's what I'm going to do here. So I can more or less just go ahead now and copy and paste this code here. So I'm using the auditing discount repository as kind of a blueprint or a template for implementing the, audi uh, the, the auditing interceptor here. So I'm just copying that in. And um, did I do something wrong? Ah, need the thread here. So the only thing that's really wrong with this right now is that we have hard-coded at discount. And obviously, we don't know whether we are actually decorating at discount or some other method. So we don't really know. We can't, at compile time, write anything here. But the invocation, fortunately, has a lot of in information about the method that's currently being uh, decorated. So we can just use uh, the name of that one. So that's basically it. I'm, I'm just checking whether this compiles. Uh, it does. So I just want to add security as well. That's even simpler. So um, let's do that. Sec secure interceptor, just like that. So I don't even have a snippet for this because it's so damn easy to implement. There we go. And we can just go ahead and look at the secure repositories that we had and say, well, here's the blueprint for that. Let's just copy and paste that. Let's go back and say, this is what's going to happen once and for all. Now, again, delegation, we don't know which repository we're actually de uh, decorating here, so I'm just going to do the same thing that I did before and say invocation proceed. So that's it. What I can do now here is now I've actually um, defined the security aspect or the authorization aspect and the auditing aspect in one class each. And those things that I, I had before, like the secure repositories here, I don't need those anymore. I can just delete those. I don't want to have to maintain those things. And also the uh, auditing discount repository and the auditing product repository here, let's, let's get rid of those. We don't need them anymore. So, still compiling. Now, before they can actually be used, we have to tell the container about them. So right now, if I'm running the application, we're just back at the original core implementation here. So no aspects are currently in use. So 
I don't know if you can tell this, so let's move this up. So I want to tell the container about those two um, aspects that I just created here. So I'm just saying component for, uh, let's do the security first, secure interceptor. So we're just telling Castle Windsor that there is a component um, called secure interceptor that, that it can use. And the same thing goes for the other one. And um, we'll just go component for auditing interceptor, same piece of code. Now, you might think that this is enough to add those aspects, but it turns out it isn't. So if I run this application right now, uh, I forgot to press the control key, we still do only have the, um, the, basic, the basic behavior. And actually, I just want to do one thing here. I want to get rid of this uh, current principle here just to show you that we don't have any security aspects running at the moment because I just commented out this uh, current principle where that makes me a store manager. So if we have the security aspect running at the moment, we shouldn't see anything. And, and we do see the original core behavior implemented still. So we have neither security or um, auditing enabled at the moment. So adding the, the components to the container itself doesn't really wire up the aspects. It just makes those components available to the container. And this is necessary, so I'm, that's why I, I, I did th those two lines of code. It's going to have to be there, but it's not enough. We need to tell um, the container exactly how it should apply those interceptors. And the reason why we need to explicitly do this is because if we had just had those security and, and auditing interceptors wired up for interceptor to the iAuditor interface. And if you recall, the implementation of the auditing interceptor has a dependency on iAuditor. So we would kind of had had an infinite recursion if we just naively would have applied the, the aspects to any kind of, of interface defined in the container. So that's not what we want to do. We want to be a little bit more sophisticated about it. So, um, so let's ha have a look at how we would go ahead and do that. So the way that we do that is by something called a point cut. So that's a very fancy name. Um, and then this is just so that when we talk about aspect-oriented programming, we talk about point cuts. Uh, I don't know why it's, it, it really has this name. It, it, it's, it's, it's an old name. Um, but basically what it is, it's just a rule that matches aspects to, um, to implementations or, or to, um, to, to the core implementations of interfaces. So basically if we have... In this situation here, we have on the left-hand side, we have a, a lot of concrete classes that each implement an interface, and the container should probably know about those things. And then on the right-hand side, we have some, um, some uh, aspects that we want to kind of match those thing things together. The point cut is just the rule that matches those things together. So that's a point cut. So very fancy name. You shouldn't be scared of it. It's actually not that difficult to understand what it does. A point cut is, is typically defined as code. Um, so we just write code that defines how, how we make this uh, matching happen. So we can write code which is as um, stupid or as sophisticated as we would like. So we could definitely just go ahead and create some kind of static matching saying, well, iFoo should have the XYZ and the ABC aspects applied and, uh, you know, I bar should only have the XYC aspect applied and, and so on. So we could kind of just create a list, a static list of, of matchings that, that we want to do. And we might even, if we felt particularly masochistic, we might even define that in an XML file. <laughs> yeah. I know peop some people just love XML. I, I, I don't really. Yeah. So, but we can do other things because a point card, we can define a point card in code. We can actually be a bit more sophisticated about this. So what we can do, for example, is uh, define the point card as a convention saying that if the uh, things on the le left-hand side fit into a certain convention, it will have certain aspects applied to it. And I want to show you how that would look like because that's just, just, just mo so much more exciting. So wanna, what I want to do here for the last um, demo here is just adding this uh, point card that I need. So uh, first of all, I, I'm going to write store manager here. And you should now go, <gasps> he's writing a class that's called something with manager. No, I'm going to write a store, card, ma store, manager, store manager point cut here. So this is the point cut for the store manager. The store manager is actually a role in the, um, in the application. So that's OK. So I can get away with writing a class that has manager in it. 
and still be nicely object oriented. Ah, that's cool. So um, to um, apply a point cut for Castle Windsor, I have to implement an interface just like before. Not the I interceptor interface, but something called I model. Let's see if I can remember this. I model uh, interceptors with an S selector. I think that's the. Um, so that's horrible, horrible name here. Yeah, I got it right. So basically, they could just have called it I point cut. But I guess the designers of Castle Winter may not actually have been aware of the concept of a point cut, or maybe they just decided to call it something else. But basically, conceptually, this is just I point cut. So what it does is it follows this uh, pattern in .NET called the tester duo pattern, uh, where first we have a method that returns a boolean that says, do you, do you have any do you have any interceptors for this particular model, this particular service that, that I'm wiring up at the moment? And only if this method uh, returns true will this, this second method be invoked. So what, what Castle Windsor is going to do is, for every model, for every component that it wires, it's just going to ask this, um, this point cut, do you have interceptors for this particular thing? And if the answer is true, then it's going to say, well, then please give me those interceptors. So, um, so the first thing we want to do here is define that convention where we're saying if, if, if a particular convention is followed, we want to apply those aspects. So what we could do here, for example, is saying, well, for every interface whose name ends with repository, we want to apply those aspects. So that's pretty easy to do, actually. So we're just going to go return, and then we're look at the, looking at the model here. So the model is just Castle Winter's model of what it is that it's currently wiring up. And it has, for example, an, uh, um, a property called implementation, which is mapping to the concrete implementation of something. So that would be my um, console discount repository or my console product repository. But it also tells me the abstraction from which I'm, I'm mapping here. So the service, that would be I discount repository or I product repository. So that's the, the abstraction. So that might not be an interface. So that's the first thing I want to make sure that it's actually an interface. It might be an abstract base, base class or something like that. Oh. Um, so that's the first part of the rule. The next part of the rule that, that I want to have um, should be that the service should have a name that ends with repository. So that's it. So um, the beauty of, of this is that, that this is going to match both of the repositories that I have at the moment. But if I add new repositories that fit into this convention, they, are, are, they will are, um, automatically be applied with those same aspects here. So more convention-based thing here. So the next thing I want to do here is just return those interceptor references, saying, well, this point cut adds some interceptors. So I'm going to do that. And the first thing I want to do here is add the, um, the secure uh, interceptor. So interceptor reference. So there's a static method here. And I really need to have the using thing going on for me here. So what I'm saying here, I don't actually return the interceptor it's itself. I return a reference to the interceptor here. So first of all, I wanted the secure interceptor because ordering here actually matters. So And I wanted to, the security aspect to be applied before the um, auditing aspect because the security aspect may actually cause the rest of the code not to run. So it's important that this goes first. <clears throat> and I do the interceptor reference for the other one as well. Mm, so that's auditing. Now the reason why I, I, we use interceptor references and not just return interceptors uh, themselves is because those interceptors might have dependencies by themselves. This one, for example, does. It depends on I auditor. So we shouldn't have the responsibility of wiring those things up manually. Castle Windsor can do this for us, and it might also want to manage the lifetime of the interceptors and so on. So we just say, be, please apply that, that type of interceptor, uh, and you figure out how to wire it up. So this is what we want to return. So the last thing that we want to do here is, if we look at the signature of the method, we actually get uh, an array of interceptor references passed into the method. And the reason why that happens is because we may have more than one point cut defined on the container. So this may not be the first point cut running. Uh, this might actually be the second or the third or, or whatever. And um, 
we, we are actually given an opportunity here to throw away those other interceptors that, di that previous point cuts defined and say, well, yeah, they, they kind of thought that this was going to be happening, but guess what? It's not going to be happening anyway because now I'm going to throw them away. Uh, so that's the chance we're getting here by actually uh, being past the other uh, references here. But I'm going to play nice in this case, and I'm just going to concat those um, interceptors that are passed in with the ones that I'm just creating at the moment. And then I need to do a two array because the method signature here uh, says that we should have an array of interceptor references. So I'm almost done here. So the last thing that I have to do at all is just tell Castle Windsor about this point cut. So this happens a little bit differently. We'll have something called the proxy factory and we'll tell that one about the store manager point cut. There we go. So before, if you uh, recall, I just commented this thing out and I just had the core behavior going on. Now I should have both the security aspect applied and the auditing aspect applied. So if I'm not a store manager, and I'm not a store manager at the moment, we should expect nothing to happen. So the test of whether the security aspect is actually being successfully applied is that nothing should actually happen, and nothing does happen, so it, it works. So if we put on back on this generic principle here, <laughs> making the running app, uh, application here a store manager, now the security um, should, the, the authorization should actually succeed and we should see both the original behavior and the auditing as well. So let's see if that actually worked. It does. Yay. Whew. That's great. And if you remember, I actually deleted all the security decorators that I did and all of the auditing uh, decorators that I did, uh, that I created at the start of this session here. So the only thing that I have left of those aspects are just those two classes. And no matter how many times I want to apply those aspects, I don't have to add uh, more code for that. And even if I just fit into that convention of saying, I am, called, I am an interface and it's called something that ends with repository, those aspects will just automatically be applied. So the thing that I talked about before here is saying we, we want to add a new feature, but then there's, there's all, the, all of those aspects that, that need to apl be applied. We don't have to worry about that anymore because we can just add the feature and if we fit into that convention, those things are just automatically going to be applied. So uh, all these uh, aspects are added on a class base. So all these aspects are added on a so class base. So if I only have a, um, an aspect that I want to add to certain methods, well, then you have to write a little bit more code within the aspect because basically what you want to do here is then you want to, you know, look at this invocation and then, you know, examine what, what, what the method is actually going to look like. But be aware that this, this is probably not something that you want to do because an aspect is a cross-cutting concern and this is something that you want to apply uniformly across a lot of different things. So if you have, you know, if you have a lot of logic that determines oh, it should only work for this kind of thing and so on, maybe you don't want to do that. But you could all, that, yeah, so that would be solid because that's the I in, in, in solid. So um, let me just round off and I'll, I'll take your question there afterwards. Or, uh, is, is this completely related to this? Or? Oh, okay, so because I'm, I'm running out of time here uh, as well. So just to, to uh, come back to the objective here, I wanted to add aspects in a solid and dry manner. And the uh, conclusion of this is staying solid is actually very, very easy to do. It just requires loose coupling, and you can just go ahead and use decorator, 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 decorator all the time. I should really you know, move back and forth just like Steve Ballmer say, decorator, 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 decorator. Um, not going to do that anymore than I just did. Um, so staying dry, on the other hand, requires dynamic interception. Uh, so that's, that's a little bit more difficult. You need a dynamic proxy library to do that for you. They're free. Uh, lose, uh, open source, um, but it's still something that you need to know about. <coughs> Finally, um, rounding off, um, my name is Mark Seaman, and I have um, a book coming out on dependency injection in .NET uh, from Manning Press. I just want to do a little bit of, of commercial dance here. So it's actually in production at the moment. It's not printed yet, so you cannot buy a hard copy, but you can buy the um, rough cut of it already in electronic format. And if you do that, and also do that for all of your family members and onborn I may actually earn a little bit of money from, uh, from that, so that, I would <laughs> so that would be awesome. <laughs> so otherwise, I don't really have a lot of time for questions, but I'm going to be around for the next three days here, so you can just go ahead and ask me anything you want. Well, 
I may refuse to answer, uh, depending on the question. Um, <laughs> but otherwise, if there's something that you want to ask me afterwards about, then um, um, I have my blog there, blog.plur.dk, which has lots of contact information and lots of blogging about DA, uh, DI, and also on Twitter, uh, at Plur, uh, is a good way to, to get a hold of me. Uh, so let me just take your question now, and I think I can probably do one or two more questions, and then we're, we're done. So, so just rephrasing the question here. So I think it's been recorded. So, so what if you want to have more granularity in your in your um, in the aspects, uh, for example, for security, where you want to say, depending on what the role is, um, I want to do different things. Well, the answer is the same as the other one here. Uh, you have to. You, the, basically, the only thing that you, that you can do is either you know kind of investigate your invocation uh, and and which provides you a context of what's actually happening at the moment and then write imperative code that, that it, uh, does the right thing. Or you might want to have different point cuts that applies different um, interceptors depending on some other kind of rule. You might definitely want to uh, do that instead. But still, be a little bit uh, cautious about if you want to do a lot of conditional processing in your aspects, they're probably not cross-cutting concerns anymore because they're, now they're actually kind of uh, modifications of the feature. So, and, and if you do that, um, I might just want to say, well, then just go with a standard decorator because that's just more apparent what it is that's going on to, you know, it's just going to be more maintainable because mo more developer, the developers will understand what's happening. So, cross-cutting concerns, pretty, keep the, the interceptors pretty much for uniform uh, code. Uh, that probably is going to work best. Any other question? Well, we're almost all out of time anyway, so thanks for listening.